So this week's episode of the Red 78 podcast was released just as the news broke that Munster head coach Johan van Graan is set to leave the province at the end of the season. For Quinny and Neve Briggs, outside pressure from fans expecting more success may have driven this decision. I think he's a good guy. I've had dealings with him. Um, very well, very re- well respected guy. Um, but there's there's this expectation and pressure with Munster. And, and I have a feeling that Johan hasn't felt the love from outside the group, I think. From what I hear internally, the players, he's very popular with the players. There's a good, good morale, even though they've had to take a lot of ups and downs in the last couple of years. Um, maybe it's outside, the outside influence and what Johan himself is feeling has made this decision. Um, the Munster fans are renowned for being wonderful fans and brilliant supporters of the team, going right back to my time. But they're pretty demanding as well and, and impatient, I think. And that impatience has increased in the last number of years, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. I think I think a lot to do when you're looking across the, the province borderlines and you're seeing what Leinster are doing and how the type of game, you know, the game that they play. Um, it's it can be easier on the eye at times, and um, and I think that you know from a supporter's point of view, you know you want to you want to try and win as many trophies or as you know be up there with the Lancers. But I think to be fair, you know this group of players probably this year maybe, but and a little bit of last year. But I think that there was a, a time there when that group of players, you know, Europe has gone so tough. And Quinny, we've spoken about this so many times about how difficult it is. To win a trophy, especially in Europe, and when you're up against the likes of the teams, the French teams that can pay huge amount of wages and they can attract players from all over the world, um, it can be really difficult to compete with that. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, Alan Quillen and Neve Briggs in the Red 78 podcast talking about the pressure that Johan van Graan would have been under from the expectation of the fans. Uh, Keen Tracy, the Irish Independent, is with us this morning. Keen, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? Um, this is a very interesting story, right? This is a, you, you've got good detail um, in your piece about the contract. We were all like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen with the contract. Will he sign? Won't he sign? He had signed. He'd signed a two-year extension in the summer, apparently. But there's a clause that allows him to get out. Um, why do they have those clauses in the, these contracts? What's the point of them? Yeah, um, I suppose I'm no expert on employment law and in, in contracts, but I guess it's protected the employer as well that it has a six month break if the employer wanted to release the coach, if say he or she was underperforming. And um, I suppose the one thing you can say is it's the same clause that Pat Lamb left Bristol or left Connacht for Bristol in, in 2017, and it's the same one that Rassi Erasmus left Munster as well. So unfortunately, Munster fans and Munster themselves have been down this road before. You know, like I mentioned in this piece as well, I think it's come as a major disappointment. I think the contract was actually agreed uh, verbally as far back as March of this year and signed in August. So Munster were certainly prepping and the RFU were, who were obviously central to the negotiations that Van Graham was going to be in charge until 2024. So this has come a bit out of the blue, to say the least. It's kind of embarrassing for the RFU then. Well, I mean, it, it keeps happening, but like, I mean, the one thing I'd say is they obviously have the clause in their contracts for for a reason. Um, what that reason is, like I said, maybe it's to protect them if a coach was underperforming, but I suppose the counterpoint to that is rugby isn't really like football in that you, you very rarely see head coaches sacked mid-season or anything like that. So, look, it's messy. Um, I think, yeah, like I was doing a bit of digging on it yesterday. I think when you kind of read the Munster statement, you took it as face value that it it read like that he had turned down the offer of a two year contract. But as it transpires, that's not what actually happened. Um, Van Graan is due to speak to the media today. I think it'll be interesting to get his take on it. Um, But from my information is that uh, his head was turned by a very strong offer from Bath. And that looks like where he's going to end up, which throws up all sorts of problems because it's not just Van Graan, obviously, who's leaving. Stephen Larkin has already confirmed that he's going back to the Brumbies. And my expectation would be that JP Ferreira, the defence coach, would go to bat with uh, Johan Van Graan because similar, I suppose, to when Rassi left, he took Jack Dean Arbor with him because he's his right-hand man, always has been. They're, the two of them are double act. Van Graan and JP Ferreira are very much uh, cut from the same cloth. So Munster are essentially looking at at least three new coaches. Graham Roundtree, the forwards coach, is also out of contract at the end of the season. 
Now, I believe he has settled well in Limerick with his family, but I mean, who knows? Like, I mean, it depends on who Munster are going to go for. If the new man wants to bring in his own people, Roundtree is obviously hugely regarded, but I suppose for a province who have craved continuity over the last few years, haven't had so much co coaching upheaval, uh, this is the last thing they need is um, even if they do have a few months to, to get their sort of house in order, they had been preparing for Van Grant to be the coach for the next two years. So in terms of like succession planning, it's, yeah, it's just not ideal at all. No, I, I just like, I understand that um, these clauses exist for a reason, but it does feel like if, if a manager or a coach is underperforming, the association just soaks up the, okay, we're going to pay out your contract and we're going to pay you for the next year and a half. And it's wasted money, it's dead money, but it was because we made the wrong decision. That should really be their protection against something underperforming. And in, in this instance, presumably it would only have been one year that they would have had to pay. It just feels like it's a bit one-sided. And if it already happened with Pat Lamb, you would feel like, okay, we've, we've learned the lesson here. You're going to be tied to us. And it's the can't be a little bit pregnant thing. But it, I don't know. Just the, the way that the IRFU goes about all of its business seems opaque and uh, difficult to understand. Why, why wasn't everybody informed in the summer? Van Grand has signed up for two years and, and we're all confident that he's going to stay. That's the first part. And the second part is, would Larkham have taken the, the big gig if it was offered to him, if he knew that... I mean, I understand that there was a, a personal reasons involved in that too, but might he have been tempted by the big gig if he thought that Van Grand was leaving? I don't know. Yeah, I suppose the first part of that, why didn't they announce it? I, like it's hard to gauge when when provinces and the IRFU announce certain things. I mean, you see it with contracts it's more often than not. It's kind of when there's bad news in the air and they kind of drop it in. Then I would have thought that they, they felt in no rush that he had signed on the dotted line, and then the Bath offer has come probably out of nowhere. And, and to be fair, like Van Grand has been was actually linked with Bath before he came to to Munster. So nice place to live. Uh, they I know they're absolutely terrible this season, including against Leinster last season, but. They've got plenty of money there. Maybe Van Grand thought he had taken Munster as far as he can go, which wouldn't suggest to be the case because he had signed on. And Munster and the IRFU believed that he was the man to take them forward as well, which is probably another discussion point. But just on Stephen Larkham, yeah, like I think it's a fair question to ask, but I don't think that that would have been the case. Um, my understanding is that the family reasons are very much behind Stephen Larkham's decision to, to re return home. Um, I remember covering the story when he came to, when he moved to Limerick in the first place, a huge priority of his was his daughter's. Um, I don't think his daughter, one particular daughter, has settled that well um, in school in Limerick. And I mean, you're in the middle of a pandemic. It's probably very hard to, you know, settle in at, at the best of times. They're a long way from home. So, it's, it's kind of easy to put two and two together with that, but I, I think Larkham's uh, heart was set on going home anyway. Um, and I'm writing, a, I wrote a piece in today's paper, you know what, like maybe this clean break is is what all parties needed um, to push on to the next level. That would be my opinion on it all. It definitely does feel that there's maybe a bit more of a mixed mood around this than there would have been around Pat Lamb or Rassi Erasmus being allowed to leave the country, that there is a feeling that could the opportunity that this provides actually give Munster a better future than maybe another two years of Van Graham would have provided anyway. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, to be honest with you, Owen, but clearly Munster and the IRFU don't agree because they had they had tied him down to a, to a two-year deal. Um, I guess my view of it all would be Van Graham has probably taken Munster as far as he can. If we think back to when he came in in November 2017, I think a huge part of his brief was to steady the ship after Erasmus up and left Similar enough circumstances, a bit more controversial, obviously, at the time. Um, but you look at, like, uh, like he would point to Munster consistently getting to, to play off and knockout matches, but I would ask what Munster have actually done in them. Um, I don't think the game plan that he, he's been playing is the way rugby is moving. Uh, we see that even with Ireland at the moment, they're trying to change it up. I think we've seen signs of Munster trying to do it, but I think ultimately when it comes to crunch, they revert to type. Um so I don't think this Munster squad is caught out to play a South African type of game plan. I think, you know, I think Van Gran will leave very solid foundations for whoever comes in. You look at the Wasps game last weekend, the academy seems to be much more on track. Um, someone like Ian Costello has, has come in and done a superb job already with that regard. And even 
there's a sense that like you know Munster being kind of reconnected to to maybe what it was I mean in, especially in terms of the AIL I, I don't think that that's a coincidence that it's happened since Ian Costello has come back from Wasps either you, you look at all the young lads who played last week they've been playing away in the AIL and Munster have been keeping a very close track in them whereas maybe in years gone by it was just like you know well number one a lot of players weren't being released to play for them so I think Van Grand has done certainly done a good job in certain elements of, of since he's been in charge but I just think this is a massive opportunity now I, I wouldn't be doom and gloom about it if, if I was a monster supporter I think I think the opposite a- right yeah I think you're right that like it's an it's a, if they get the right person it's actually exciting because as Neil Briggs said there like monster fans are looking over at Leinster going Jesus they're playing great rugby and it's really successful for them why can't we have that and it turns out they can have that because their playing squad is brilliant yeah, and I don't really I, like. I don't really agree with kind of the overall point that maybe Quinny and Eve were were making there. That you know the fans have played a major part in this. I think Munster fans are right to be expectant um, of this of this team. I mean, I know past history you can look back on that, but if you look at the quality that's within this squad, can anyone really say that this coaching team has got the best out of what's been there over the last couple of years? I would say no. Um, a huge, I mean, element of that like responsibility has to go on the players as well as senior players, but. I just think Munster have been too slow to move at the times um, and that's been evident, like I said, any time they get to knockout games because they just kind of go back into their shell. I think there's been times where it's looked like they've been wanting to play more expansively, even you think back to earlier this season in that Scarlets game, but I, I, I'm just not convinced that that's, go, that's going to be the way or even any sort of way they're going to play if they come up against a Leinster or a Toulouse in, in, in the Champions Cup. So. Look, I think you're right, Jerry. It, it all depends on who they go out and get. Um, this They have time to get it together, but it has put them on the back foot, like I said, because Munster were preparing for Van Grand to, to be there for the next two years. Um, like I said, there's very solid foundations there. Munster is always going to have an allure, like absolutely always for anyone, but it's about getting the right people. I'd love to see them be a bit ambitious um, with this next coaching ticket. Uh, like you think back again to when Van Grand came in, no one had really heard of him that much. He he came recommended by Rassi Erasmus, you know. So um, you'd like to go out and see them get, you know, a really ambitious team. But I guess a lot of that will depend on budgets and who's available. And you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it. But there's there's no shortage of contenders. But a lot of them are under contract. But I suppose my argument to that would be Munster's last two coaches, Rassi Rasmus and Johan Van Gran, have now left while and they, they were, were on. Yeah, exactly. So why don't why don't Munster go out and try and you know put it, if it's a Ron O'Gara, put an offer that they can't refuse? So just to, uh, to clarify for for anybody, it's actually going to be the IRFU making the hire and paying the money, right? So it's the Munster coaching job, but you work for the IRFU. It's one of those weird. You have you have to have a split personality while you, your your fan base, our Munster fans. First, your job is with the IRFU, and so when they tell you that Craig Casey has to play a certain number of minutes and uh, Conor Murray has to play a certain number of minutes and the two young out has to play, you've got to do what you're told. Yeah, spot on. So, like David Nusifora, the IRFU performance director, will be will be all over this. But uh, yeah, that's kind of I guess the way it's been for for the last few years, and. I think that's why maybe there's a little bit of disappointment, maybe touching on anger within IRFU level because Van Gran has been, I would say, very obliging in, in terms of things like that. He's worked well with the IRFU. You know, New Sephora gave him a new contract when he still had a year left to run. So this has probably annoyed him a little bit, I would suggest, that he's had his head turned by Bath. But again, I, I just think there's a massive opportunity here. Um, I think, like, his contract was obviously up for renewal anyway, and all the signs were that he was going to sign on for two years. And, like, if I'm being honest, I was wondering if that was the right decision anyway. So, you know, maybe Munster and the RFU were going to get a, a get-out-of-jail-free carriage with this. But again, it all depends on who they go and get in. Who is the coach that is most in line with the brand of rugby that you would like to see Munster play? I mean, there's loads out there. It's, it's like if you're if you're playing a dream team or whatever, like you'd say someone like Scott Robertson would be amazing to see come in. And you, you talk about great clauses in his contract. He's actually been honest enough um, and come out. And for anyone who obviously doesn't know, he's the Crusaders coach and was kind of, a lot of Kiwis would tell you, was shafted for the, for the All Blacks job. And a lot of Kiwis actually want to see him in the All Blacks job instead of Ian Foster. But 
he's contracted to the Crusaders until 2024. Uh, but he actually has a break clause in his contract that allows him to get out of it a year, a year early if he doesn't get the All Blacks job, essentially after the, the next World Cup. So the expectation would be that he would be the next man in. But I think recent developments for someone like Joe Schmidt has just joined the All Blacks team. So for me, that change, that muddies the waters, particularly for someone like Scott Robertson. You know, is Joe Schmidt going to have his eyes on getting that job next? So I'd love to see them being ambitious, at least picking up the phone to, to someone like him. Um, I mean, you just have to look at the Crusaders' record. Obviously, a different kind of task coming to Munster, but it would be class to see someone like that at Munster. I mean, the obvious one that everyone's going to talk about is Ronan O'Gara. I'm just waiting for you lads to get him on the show to, so you can grill him to see what his crack is. Um, like, I feel like the time is right from a Munster point of view to do everything they can to try and get this, you know, dream team coaching ticket, you know, O'Gara is well settled in La Rochelle, O'Connell is well settled in Ireland, Mike Prendergast, you know, is well settled in Paris, but if they're not going to go out and get them now when there is essentially a clean slate, when is it going to happen? There's already been some suggestion that when the time comes, O'Gara could actually bypass Munster and go straight to the Ireland setup. You know, who, if Andy Farrell didn't stay on after the 2023 World Cup, so well, can I, um, just, that's interesting to tease out because is is Paul O'Connell not the natural successor now to Andy Farrell, and so for him to go back into the meat and drink of the day and day stuff, day to day stuff in, in Munster, seems like it would be a swerving off that career path, particularly when. He's getting so much credit for how well Ireland are playing. Like it seems like for both of them, it just seems like the time is wrong. I, I get your point from Munster's perspective. It's like do everything you can to convince the IRFU to spend the money they need to spend. But for the for them, like if if you plot this out, right? Say say the World Cup goes really well and Andy Farrell stays on. Maybe at that point, Paul O'Connell has to look sidewards and go, all right, I want to I want to get a bit more experience. Or maybe if things go really well then Paul O'Connell gets all the credits that he gets for that and he's part of a, an Ireland team that have reached the semi-final in the World Cup. That's where it would need to go for Farrell to, to decide that he wants to stick around or if he doesn't want the England job as, as it would be offered to him at that point because he's done a good job with Ireland too. So there's a lot there's a lot there or you get stuck in and then you've got those, you know, it's, it's a much different workload, it's a much different pressure, it's a much different environment. I don't know. I, I can't see that happening at the moment. No, I, like, I mean, I'm not for a second suggesting it will happen, but I just think from a monster point of view, they have to make like the likes of O'Connell and O'Gara actually turn them down and say no, and with a realistic with a realistic offer. I, like O'Connell has already been on the record as, and saying that he's enjoying the fact that he's not in the daily grind of a club. He's got more time with his young family and stuff, and that's absolutely fair enough. And you're spot on, Jer. Like you look at the impact that he's had, it, it feels like he's actually been in the Ireland setup longer than he has. It's still only been a year. Um, he's a key man in that. But I just feel like, you know, Van Grand has had his head turned by Bath. I, I just feel like Munster should do everything they can to try and turn their heads. I would agree. I think it's still a long shot um, in terms of happening. But I, they just have to, they have to go out and I, I think do everything they can. I think. The thing about Munster at the moment is as well, it's probably worth mentioning that there, there's so much other, so many other issues. Like you, you think of that they're going to probably need a defence coach now, but also like in terms of player recruitment, like there's a lot of contracts um, up at the end of the season, including the likes of Damien Dielende and Orgy Snyman. Like what does the future hold for them now? I know they obviously signed for Munster as a club, but Van Gran was the man who brought them in. Um, I think that, that their futures are very much up in the air. You know, if Munster are looking at potential new signings, who's the one signing them? Or like, what sort of project are the players signing up for? So, I think it puts them on the back foot in in many aspects. To be honest, it, 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 to, to deliver maybe like a bit of a glass half empty view on Munster's prospects over the next little while. You mentioned Johan van Graan comes in as as a relative unknown to the Munster job, doesn't win anything with Munster. Munster can't keep a hold of him and goes to Bath. How can Munster then expect to attract the cream of the crop if this is what's after happening to a coach who comes in under the radar and actually doesn't win anything? And, I mean, we're seeing a reaction coming in this morning. I think you've alluded to yourself, Keen, this morning. That he hasn't, didn't do a great job. Uh, and it still seems that there is a sense that Munster have lost hold of this guy. So how, how can they really set their, their targets so high when this is what's after happening? 
I guess like to play devil's advocate, they would argue that the, there's solid foundations there for, for someone else to come in and build on. I would agree. Um, I think like Van Gran is really well liked by the squad. And that was one thing that people had said about him before he came in. He was best man. He was best man at a couple of Springbok weddings and things like that. I think his man management, and even I think back to how he managed this sort of the Joey Carberry situation when he was coming back from injury, is second to none. But like you look at his record and if we're being honest and we take the emotion out of it, it doesn't look great that a guy who hasn't been able to deliver silverware has essentially turned his back and changed his mind on Munster. Um, I mean, in hindsight, Munster maybe would have preferred to got out in front and said, look, your contract's up at the end of the season. Thanks very much for everything you've done. We're yeah. going to move in a different direction. But that, and that's a little bit damning, I think, because Munster wanted to continue on this uh, trajectory, which goes back to one of my initial points. Like I think there could be this could be a blessing in disguise. I agree with you. I, I, uh, Johan van Grand. It's been Grand, right? It's mm. been it's been fine. I like the when you when you talk about the good base to build on. Like he had a good base to build on. Razzie had actually set, steadied the ship a lot and and had made it a more attractive job. Like Razzie was one of the big names in world rugby, and we all knew he was going to go to South Africa if they came calling because that's where his heart was and like that was the right thing for him to do with this it was like a completely unproven brand new coach cutting their teeth there's every chance that he goes on to become a Warren Gatlin figure and learns a lot and has soaked up a lot from this environment and goes and and isn't isn't pay, isn't uh, working for two paymasters it's Bruce Craig and that's it like i i don't know i i think that um it's a big opportunity for them but i think it's a bit of a shit show from the IRFU where they've signed somebody up to a two-year deal and they've given him the opportunity to walk out six months later and he's done that and now they're scrabbling for somebody where there's no natural successor within the squad and I don't know maybe maybe somebody from the Ireland coaching ticket is there maybe maybe they look at Easterby and say this is your time maybe they look within the other provinces and say there's somebody there who we're going to give a, a full coaching ticket to but again it's not obvious it doesn't look like they have a plan and I, I think this all goes back David Yusufora gave this guy a contract now the contract has a clause in it. Somebody's waved a checkbook. Away he goes. Who's responsible for this? And who's holding David Nusifora to account for it? Nobody. Yeah, I guess you could probably say that about a, a couple of remits um, in that job. But yeah, like you're right. I, I don't think there is a plan in place yet. Um, Munster might argue otherwise. But I mean, I don't think, you know, sometimes when when these kind of things happen and the coaches leave, there, there is an obvious person waiting in the wings to step in. I don't think that's the case. Even you think back, like you think about Stephen Larkham, obviously his decision has been announced uh, a few weeks now and there hasn't really been any word about, you know, who might be, been a couple of names thrown around but absolutely nothing solid yet. So um, I think there's, there's other questions to ask. Like if you remember when Rassi Rasmus came in, he came in as a director of rugby initially um, and then, you know, circumstances dictated that he became the head coach and when Johan van Graan came in, and you're right, Jerry, I think that kind of gets forgotten about as well, that he had never been a head coach before, so Munster took a massive chance on him, but when he came in, it was as head coach, and you were kind of wondering why Munster ditched the idea of a director of rugby when it seemed like that was the route they wanted to go down, so I think it'll be interesting to see whether they look for a director of rugby type figure um, as their next appointment or if it will be a hands-on coach because there are there are pretty big differences um, in the day-to-day -day, the running of, of a club like that. So they've got a lot of things to, to figure out. But like I said, they've been caught off guard here. Yeah. I don't know, there's been grumblings over the last couple of weeks, but um, apart from that, Van Cran was signed up for the next two years. That director of rugby model is essentially what Leinster have, although the titles aren't. Uh, but, but Leo Cullen effectively is director of rugby, and they have a head coach in uh, in Lancaster, and it works brilliantly. And you can see how Lancaster is obviously uh, a massive name whenever any of these jobs come up in England because he's doing such a great job. But maybe maybe Munster should look for that and. Munster should look for that director of rugby to be a Munster employee who has Munster at heart and that's the gig and I know that that would cause a bit of tension with the IRFU but there's no chief executive uh, in the IRFU at the moment and now is the time perhaps to to get that and kind of reassert themselves and reassert their, their position. I, anytime I talk to people I have a tendency to get a bit of Stockholm Syndrome. We had Jerry Flannery on the show recently and I was blown away by just the, the level of uh, second order thinking that he has about stuff and he has now got a bit of distance from 
the situation. I can see him being a brilliant head coach at Munster at some point. It might be too soon, but maybe it's not, you know? But there's no, that, that's the thing, there's no shortage of guys like Jerry Flannery. You know, we've mentioned Ron O'Gara, Mike Prendergast, someone like James Collin. Even someone like Jason Holland, I think, is going to be an interesting one with the Hurricanes. Um, I was actually watching a, a video he had done with New Zealand TV a few months back. And even then he spoke about, you know, kind of one day wanting to come back to Munster. Uh, obviously, he's contracted with the Hurricanes until 2023. But someone like him would be very interesting as well. And your example of Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster is spot on. And even there's been sort of word this season that Connacht have kind of gone a similar type of way, not not exact same in that Andy Friend has taken a slight step back to have a more kind of helicopter view of uh, what Connacht are doing. So it seems like that's the way Irish rugby wants to go. Um, so it, yeah, it'll be fascinating to see if Munster, if Munster do it because I would agree. I think it would be no harm to kind of have a, a monster voice. Like there was a lot of talk when Van Grand came in that I we're pretty. Sure it was the first time in the first time ever that Munster didn't have um, a homegrown coach on the on the coaching staff at all. So um, I'm not saying that it has to be all Munster men or anything like that. But I think it would be no harm to have a voice like that because I think we're already seeing the benefits of that in what Ian Costello is doing with the academy who's monster through and through. All right, King, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Plenty to get it, uh, stuck into and we didn't even get into the, the RFU and the relationship with the women. We will be covering that again in more detail soon. Thanks a million, King. Cheers. Cheers, lads. It's 8.34. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Uh, there'll be plenty of applications, says Kieran O'Connor, and Van Graan wasn't doing that well. I don't think Van Graan leaving will be as big of a disaster as it looks if they get someone ingrained in Ireland already. It will be positive, says Doombot36. So, not living up to his name, Doombot. I, I don't think it's important that... Um, somebody is Irish I think it would be hugely beneficial if they were but if they're best coach if yeah, I think it's unlikely they're going to get Scott Robertson but if they were to get him you know that it's somebody who's going to be there for a short period of time and you would hope that the succession plan is in his backroom team and they find somebody who's simpatico and who has the potential to to grow into a, a head coach but that would be nice yeah but uh, like there is a possibility and I don't want to be too negative here but there's a possibility that the rest of the season is kind of a little bit wasted for Monster, like unless of course, unless the players really do this for Van Gran and they get over the line and for Larkham and it leads to some sort of silverware and that's the motivation they need. Of, yeah. of course, that that wouldn't be a waste. But I'm I'm just worried that you know the same thing happens as the past couple of the seasons. Drift. They, they lose to Leinster in an important game at the end of the season. They lose a, a, a Heineken Cup quarter final, maybe even a semi final, and it's the same result without finding out anything more about your coaching staff because Larkham's gone. He's not going to be the successor, and Van Gran is gone give a Giggsy till the end of the season would almost be a better sort of option to find out whether or not the Giggsy guy is actually the, the person. We're not going to find out anything more about Van Gran uh, or Larkham over the next little while because they're out the gap. Um, so, again, you need to have that person in situ. I think their CVs would definitely benefit from success this season. It would transform sure, yeah. their next job. It was like, oh, you delivered silverware of against course. all the odds. Yeah, like, so there, there is there is a, a symbiosis there that would that would definitely benefit Munster. Um, Jerry Thorny had in, uh, interesting information in his piece today. He, he thinks that there was there are doubts around the contracts for the two South Africans in particular and that that might have fed into his desire to leave, that there there's uncertainty around... Um, re-signing uh, Dialende and Snyman. Dialende is expected to move most probably back to Japan. Snyman, I, ca I can't see anybody in the Munster hierarchy saying, yeah, sign him up for a th year three. You just can't do it. You've got to cut your losses. That's It's a hard, cold reality, but this is a player who you've brought in on a massive money to play for the team. He's been unable to play for the team. The best ability is availability. He's been unavailable. I'm really sorry for your troubles go off and somebody else will pay you the money because you're going to be sensational I know you're going to be sensational you're going to have a great career afterwards mm. but we can't we can't afford to do that and also you're an opportunity blocker to the kids yeah yeah the best ability could be being 6 foot 10 and uh, the ability to show some grunt in the, the pack as well Like so I, I can see the temptation to, to, to keep him around we, have, we haven't even seen Jason Jenkins yet actually the, the other opportunity blocker that was I think he's trapped in South Africa at the moment isn't he as part of the, the, the COVID lockdown um, like, so it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out but there is definitely there definitely has obviously been a South African tint to Munster over the past few seasons it'll be interesting to see does that now dissolve over the next little hopefully, while hopefully yeah <laughs> hopefully right we'd like them to be Munster We'd like them to be the Munster 2.0, whatever that is. Like, I mean, the, uh, some of the kids in the pack the other day didn't look too bad. No, they look brilliant. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. It's like, it looks like, 
it's a bit like the villa job. It's all set up for somebody to come in and just immediately go, right, this is what we're doing, this is our identity, no ifs, ands or buts, we're fully signed up. And so O'Gara would be brilliant for that, or O'Connell would be brilliant for that, but I don't know. I mean, I would love that. And O'Gara, O'Connell, Mike Prendergast, Colin, dream ticket. Yeah. How good would that be? Yeah. Yeah, no, like, I mean... It, 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 that, that is the dream ticket but it's all about timing and, and where these guys actually want to go like I'm sure you're Aston Villa reference uh, I thought you were going to like deliver a gut punch to all the Munster fans watching this morning being like both European Cup winners in ancient history or something like that no but, no yeah. Owen screw you I'm like uh, like brilliant youth coming through yeah, okay. seasoned veterans who are ready just need a little bit of leadership have, have lost their way a little bit I mean yeah. I don't think they even have lost their way this season they're going all right yeah, there's a, there's there have definitely been moments over the past couple of years to suggest that they're going in the right direction. Actually, it's just the thing that's killed Munster is the big games and the the knockout games. Leinster have constantly been the thorn in the side in the big games and the the URC or the Pro 14 or the Pro 16 and then Champions Cup knockout games. So it's again they're they're in that part where they're they're in a thin line between success and and, and failures of seasons. Okay, it is eight thirty eight this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number. You can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. We'll get to all of those in just a couple of minutes' time.